the headlines on RT International. Ultra-left activists attempt to disrupt an event by a conservative speaker, sparking scuffles just outside New York University. This election has proven how divided we are. And we look at the other side of America that's not out protesting to see why working people supported Donald Trump despite all the liberal fury directed against him now. People in the uh, more dangerous parts of the city are being evacuated from their homes in armored personnel carriers because it is unsafe to leave by foot or by car. Three days of shelling of the city of Donetsk by Ukrainian forces claimed civilian lives and the most dangerous military escalation in months. And it's revealed a London mosque was refused service from major banks for years after news agency Reuters mistakenly put it on a global terror database. Just turning midday on Friday here in Moscow. Thanks for joining us. It's RT International. Scuffles erupted outside New York University, where prominent Trump supporter and co-founder of Vice Media, Gavin McInnes, was speaking. The protesters attempted to prevent people from attending the event, in some cases by attacking them. One of those who was attacked was wearing a Make America Great Again hat, which was later stolen and burned. Several arrests were also made. Now, it all echoes the violence which was seen at a campus in California on Thursday when the editor of the news website Breitbart and a leading Trump supporter had to cancel his speech at Berkeley University. Rioters smashed property and hurled stones at police. Now, the university said it condemned the riots, adding that it regretted the fact that a peaceful protest had been hijacked. And political activist Scott Pressler says liberal protests are increasingly being taken over by the extreme left. I'm not surprised what we're seeing at the UC Berkeley campus. Violence is something that has been a big part of what we've seen from the Clinton campaign. They have been throwing eggs at us. They have been beating us. They've been attacking us. This is something that we've seen ever since Mr. Trump announced his candidacy. It was very evident that there were groups of media that were telling the entire world that this race was locked in for Hillary Clinton. So yes, to many people who followed those news sources, this was a shock. If you are unhappy with your government, there are ways to take back control that don't include pepper spraying people in the face, destroying property, and punching people. There are better ways to achieve what you want in the world without violence. The violent protests seen across America could give the impression that the country is at war with this new president, Donald Trump. But of course, they really only give half the picture of what is in fact a deeply divided country. RT correspondent Caleb Mopan went to Ohio, a state known as Clinton country, to find out why, despite the name, people there voted for Trump. Jobs. Jobs, jobs. Trying to get people back to work, that was a big thing. I think it was uh, jobs for leaving our country. The agenda of anti-Trump protesters who insist that their values are under threat doesn't really fly out here in Ohio, a place plagued by unemployment and failing infrastructure. Can you tell us why it is that people in this area voted so strongly for Donald Trump? I think it was because they liked what he said and what he had to do. And he's kind of proving it right now with all the stuff he's been doing. Well, I think he's going to turn out to be one of the best presidents we've ever had. It's improving. It, it was a big blow to Clinton County when DHL left. But I think that's improving, you know, going to be improving. Something about Trump's personality seems to really click with people in this part of America and other regions like it. Now, that's clearly not the case in New York and the West Coast.
outcry about Trump's recent executive order on immigration seemed to make the stance of U.S. voters pretty clear, except it didn't. Public opinion polls show that a majority of Americans actually favor Trump's travel restrictions. Back in Manhattan, we decided to show people some of the opinions that we recorded in the Trump belt about the protests which erupted and started during Trump's inauguration. People in their like, negative opinion of the protesters. Uh, I mean, to me, I feel like protest is a perfectly legitimate way of expressing political beliefs. Okay, well, let me ask you, we actually, we went to Ohio and we interviewed some Trump supporters about all the protests that have been happening. And, and this is what they told us. And we want you to kind of react to what they said. Is that okay? Sure. Thank you so much. Now, all these people rioting in the cities after Trump won, you know, breaking windows, protesting and stuff like that. Do you think that, do you think that they are like in touch with reality? They're just young people looking for trouble. That's all they are. Like their rights are going to be taken away? Yeah. Well, how would they know? He, he just beginning to govern. So yeah. w what do you want to say to those people? I don't believe they know America. You know, this election has proven how divided we are. And to me, this is not the way you get peace. A lot of this country is very racist, and a lot of that comes from fear of the unknown. and. And maybe they're not educated enough. When you have a population of people that only receive a certain amount of information and you don't teach people that they have to broaden their resources to then make an opinion, it's understandable where some people can form what kind of like side they would be on. I think that the only way, like what Catherine said, is that like those people need to be educated better. Trump, just like Richard Nixon in the past, talked about a silent majority that just wasn't being listened to. But now that Trump is in the White House, their voices still aren't being heard. Perhaps the problem, though, is that the other side just doesn't want to listen. Caleb Moppin, RT, New York. Meantime, an Iraqi families tried to take advantage of the criticism over Washington's restrictions on foreigners traveling to America uh, by blaming President Trump. I really, really believe this in my heart. If they would have let us in, my mom, she would have made it, and she would have been sitting right here next to me. She's gone because of him. That claim was aired on Fox News and sparked widespread headlines. However, it was later revealed the man was lying, and his mother had passed away before the Trump travel restrictions came into effect. The confirmation actually came from an imam close to that family, and he spoke with us. I know their family very well, and I know their uh, mother has died around the 22nd because the community held here a funeral home for uh, 24 and 23rd. The banning law uh, of uh, Mr. Trump uh, came, uh, I believe, um, after the death of the uh, lady. Well, unfortunately, some of the media are extreme and they're looking for a catch so they can blame uh, President Trump. I think this banning law, the immigration law of Mr. Trump, has two sides. It's meant to prevent terrorists from coming to this country. Uh, that's good. Uh, and I still remember uh, his uh, statement before the election, and this is why I voted for him. Uh, and, and the bad side of the uh, uh, law, we have a trouble in Iraq, terrorists coming from north of Iraq, from Turkey, and south of Iraq, from Saudi Arabia. So he discluded, unfortunately, Mr. Trump, discluded Turkey and Saudi Arabia. However, it's not the first time Donald Trump has been blamed for the death of a relative. For example, uh, the, uh, the following story involving a Yemeni refugee was aired on CNN. My dad passed away because we didn't have any medicine back then in Yemen because of the siege. Sorry. And my mom is now recently living in a destroyed house because of the airstrikes. Your family is suffering because our president is reckless, reckless, and his administration is incompetent. However, both the girl and Pelosi failed to mention that the Yemeni crisis was escalated when Obama was the president. The U.S. was strongly and continues to strongly support their Saudi allies in the fight against Yemeni rebels, as well as supplying Riyadh with billions of dollars worth of weapons for its military campaigns. In fact, uh, in the past eight years, under Obama, 42 separate deals were either proposed to or made with Saudi Arabia, totaling $150 billion. 
Now, the rift between Donald Trump and the media is growing ever deeper, with news outlets even devising new rules for how to cover the president. Miguel Francis Santiago takes a look. How long does it take for a global superpower to plunge down among the ranks of countries like Zimbabwe or Yemen? Apparently about 12 days, according to Reuters editor-in-chief Steve Adler, the agency's official guide on how to report all things Trump. Perhaps was supposed to be an inspiring piece, but instead it painted a pretty grim picture for America's next four years at least. It brags about the fact that Reuters has all skills necessary to counter the threat of Trump's America. All because it dealt with legal prosecution, visa restrictions, and even physical threats in, you know, such desperate places like Zimbabwe, Iraq, Yemen, and of course, Russia. So what are those skills Reuters asks journalists to utilize? Well, stay out of trouble, stay calm, and gather all your emergency resources. But what led Mr. Adler to such frustration? Well, Trump is not a big fan of mainstream media. Don't be rude. No, I'm not going to give you a question. I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. Now, see, Reuters has a problem with this. After all, the guide also points out that Trump called the MSM among the most dishonest human beings on earth, mainly because of this. Liberal media so upset, visibly upset, about Donald Trump's victory. The world's shining light of democracy has gone dark. You're not having a terrible, terrible dream. Is there going to be remnants of a neo-fascist movement that he leads in this country after oh. this election? So, does Trump perhaps have a point here? You be the judge, while Reuters talks about cultivating fair and balanced reporting in Trump's America, which this guide sidelined next to Zimbabwe. I'm Miguel Francis Santiago, RT. A London mosque has won a two-year fight to have its name removed from an influential terror database. It even got an apology and damages from the organization responsible. Holly Boyko explains. Once it's said, it's hard to unsay. Thomson Reuters' World Check database provides terrorist risk assessments for banks, and it listed London's Finsbury Park Mosque as linked to terrorism. The mosque had been associated with radical cleric Abu Hamza, but 12 years ago, back in 2005, it was taken over by new management who overhauled it and turned its image around. And so for years now, Finsbury Park Mosque has been seen as a symbol of community relations. But it seems that Thomson Reuters, who say that they provide continually updated intelligence and that they are the world's leading source for intelligence, intelligent information for businesses and professionals hadn't got the memo. As a result, the mosque says it had its bank accounts closed and sustained reputational damage. So it took Thomson Reuters to court. We've been affected badly on, on, on uh, putting us in that uh, category, the terrorism. Uh, first of all, our bank account being, being closed, we couldn't open any other bank account with any banks uh, except a small bank called Arayan, which we are grateful of. Our reputation being damaged, uh, uh, our credibility being damaged. The community here are really concerned that uh, their mosque is being labeled as, uh, as uh, uh, a terrorist uh, organization. I believe in the truth, you know. So if the news agents are, are publishing something which is lies, they got to be sued for it. They're going to do it anyhow. It makes no difference. With most of them big companies, they're going to do it. If, if, if the newspapers want to print it or the companies want to print it, they've got their outlets because they've all got their favourite journalists that they give their stories to. So it makes no difference what we do. Anyone does, they will put out the false news where they want to. But it's not right. Finsbury Park Mosque told the court that the World Check database is compiled using open source data. That means Google searches. There are no independent checks and those listed aren't even informed. The mosque has now won a libel payout and an apology from Thomson Reuters. We have made it clear in the court statements our regret for publishing certain allegations concerning Finsbury Park Mosque. All profiles on WorldCheck are reviewed on an ongoing basis. With an apology in hand, for this beleaguered mosque, the saga appears to be over. But for Thomson Reuters and its WorldCheck database, it's just the beginning. Lawyers from a number of firms are preparing more libel cases from other businesses and individuals claiming they were wrongly listed on the database. 
Polly Boyko, RT, London. Just only quarter past here in Moscow. After a very short break, we'll bring you the latest on the sudden escalation of violence in the Ukrainian conflict and reaction from the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs.